Thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's good seeing you. Some guys I recognize from last time as well. So I'll start here. This is a very rare occasion. I can't remember. It was sometime earlier this year. Everything is green. Eh? How cool is that? It's not often that you see the whole board light up green. So, um, okay, so we're going to be talking a little bit about sort of technical setups uh, and practical rules to trading. And it was tough for me to come up with the right things to do because the more I trade, the more I realize that trading is, is, uh, is actually pretty complex, you know. And I think that a mistake a lot of us make is you think that you can find like a formula that makes it work or you can find a particular setup that's just going to work every single time. And it doesn't work like that. Um, and a lot of what we're sold and told on the internet is that, you know, you don't, you need to learn a couple of basic things and then you can look at the market for like 10 minutes a day, place a few orders and you can make some money. And it doesn't quite work that way. Um, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on the, on the very short term stuff. So I tried to speak a little bit about some of the shorter term trading setups and I try to speak about the sort of medium term, longer term uh, stuff as well. Because I find that with the, this is my fourth power hour now, I think, and the last three sort of kind of built on top of each other, but they may have become, they may have gotten a bit too complex. If I had to build on top of that and continue, then it might be a little too complicated. So I'm trying to go back to sort of the basic, uh, uh, sort of the basic rules of trading. So we're going to talk about uh, a set of rules, which uh, I say there is simultaneously a set of rules as well as a process and uh, a thinking framework. It's like a way of thinking about the market. Um, as much as it is a set of rules for you to follow. So the rules are easy to follow, right? I mean, stop loss here, this, that, whatever, 2% risk management rule, whatever it is that you use. Those are the rules, but we all know them. I don't think I can tell any of you guys any of those rules that you haven't heard before. You don't want to hear me talk about the 2% rule. But how do you apply that? And that comes to uh, this thinking framework where the rules are more of a process than what they are hard and fast things because – Executing those things is not always so easy, right? Um, and then we look at some uh, some in, some setups. So there's uh, some intraday setups, longer term setups, medium term setups, and then we look a little bit at, at how to find trades, which again is more of a process than what it is really a um, uh, you know like a solution that you can get. You know, you can't go somewhere and get trades. And it's nice, there's trade idea services and that kind of stuff. But um, ultimately, I mean, I can sum it all, all up now. It's a process. You have to know where to look, and you have to have a process every day that you that you spend time looking for it. So the basic rules of trading, and I think uh, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time here. So the first goal of it, of being a trader um, is to make sure that you can survive, right? So for the last, it's been almost two years now, I think, that I've been in Cape Town, um, working with Storm Trading, trading at Storm Trading, uh, for my own account, and coaching and mentoring sort of youngsters. So we've taken in about two groups now. Um, it's about a year and a half that the first group has been there, and now only they're starting to make a little bit of money. Okay, so step one is survive. Okay, so many people come into the market, lose all their cash in a hot minute, and it's over. Okay, so the first goal of a trader is to just be able to come back tomorrow. Your job is to make sure you can stay at your seat, you can stay at the desk, you can come back tomorrow, you can trade again, you have capital in your account. So that is your first primary goal is to protect your money. After that, making money almost comes naturally. You know, Once you've learned how to play defense long enough, every now and then, like I was explaining earlier, uh, a setup comes and you can knock it out the park, and that's when you make money. The rest of the time, you're just playing for singles. You're just trying to make it out of every day, uh, you know, in the green or with a small loss as possible so that you have the opportunity to be available when the big trades come, All right? Uh, so yeah, most traders don't make it, um, which I think is a well, a known, well enough known fact. Uh, then price action is everything. So what I'm saying here is like what is happening right now in this very moment is a lot more important than what the charts tell you. I'm gonna use MTN as the example. MTN, it's got a beautiful range. Uh, it's got a very similar setup to what Sassel had a couple of years ago. And you think at about between 103, 106 is the support level. And you can sort of buy it off that. It should trade up to 135. And that's a fairly safe trade. It's been doing that range for almost a year now. And then today comes along. It opens below the level. You know, everybody initially thinks, man, this is a buy. 
but the price action in the day, the selling volume is just insane and it just overrules whatever you think your technical chart is telling you, price action rules. Okay, so what's happening now is more important than whatever we might believe about what's going to happen according to the chart or what has happened in the past uh, and you can reasonably forecast with your chart. You've got to be on top of what's going on at the moment, right? So um, staying in the now moment opportunity flow, I think I've spoken about this book many times, The Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. It's a very, very good book. Um, and it's really just about staying in the moment and staying open to the opportunities that are available to you right now, right? Um, there's no such thing as cheap or expensive, okay? So there's no space for rationality. There's no actual space for contrarian traders. Um, we ultimately, unless you are an investor, you class yourself as a trader, you want to learn to trade, you are a trader, okay? So you don't have to worry about PE ratios. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, valuations. None of that stuff matters because, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but it really it doesn't. The only thing that matters is what is the price doing? Is it going up? Is it going down? And if there's an opportunity for you to make money from that, that is what counts, right? So, um, for example, uh, when was it? It was this week. Most of the retailers were up. ShopRite was down. Okay, so what, what happened? Most of the retail traders, the guys at home, uh, will go, geez, Woolies is up 4%. Uh, Truworths and Fushini are both up like 1% and 2%. Pick and pay is even up. ShopRite's down too. What's going on? I'm going to buy some ShopRites. You know, ShopRite ended lower that day. Why? Right? Because at that point, the, the value of it, the rest of the sector doesn't matter. The fact is that day, ShopRite got downgraded and a lot of the big banks uh, you know, give out their research to funds. Funds have rules. They suddenly force sellers, and they're just dumping it. You know, so and you could see that in the way that the market was trading. It was just trending down the whole day. Every now and then it'd pull back, and that would be all the retail traders going, oh, "Okay, it's lunchtime. You know, it's definitely bouncing. Now's the chance." No, this the trader at the bank who's selling it on behalf of his hedge fund or his, you know, his unit trust client has gone on lunch. He's going to come back. He's going to be up two bucks. He's going to drill it down into the close of the day. So you've got to, and I think this is what I was saying to Simon last night. Um, we think that we can get to our desk and we can look at the chart for 10 minutes and we can make a call that is going to be accurate. And the truth is it's not, right? You've got to actually spend the time to watch the market first before you take a trade to see what is happening. Because if you're watching, for example, a five-minute candle, and I'm not suggesting that you trade on five-minute candle charts or one-minute candle charts, but if you watch one-minute and five-minute candle charts, you can actually feel the tug of war in the market because it's, it's battle between two opposing forces, buyers and sellers, going at it. And one of them is right, one of them is wrong. And if the buyer fails, the sellers win and the price comes down. And you can see that. So if we look at candlestick analysis, for example, which is something I don't really talk about here, but candlesticks are a visual representation of what the price action is doing. Okay, now we can't look at candles and go, okay, well, that's a shooting star and that's that and that's that and that's that and make our basis on that. You almost have to sit and watch it form. You've got to watch three or four candles forming. You've got to watch maybe, you know, 20, 30 minutes of, of uh, price action on a five-minute chart before you have a reasonable idea of what's actually happening. Um, Otherwise, you've fallen in a trap, you know. You have to see every time it comes down there, they push it down, they sell it up, and you see how quickly it does it, how often it does that. And if you're trading on a daily chart, then, you know, you can't sit at your desk and go, okay, I'm going to trade first round because there's a setup on it. You've got to watch first round every day, right? So this is part of your finding trades. You want to trade first round. You've got to watch it every day for three weeks. Every day, look at the closing candle, and then you can start getting a feel for, okay, this day I did that, this day I did this, da, 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 da. Okay, so last time, there's a support level. Now it gets there. Let's watch how it trades at that support level. Not just buy it because it's at 52 bucks and that's the support level. You have to see how it interacts with that support level, how it forms the candle over a number of days, and then you can make a call as to whether there's a buy or not. Right. So patience. We all want this quick sort of immediate, there's a setup trader that has to work. You can miss the setup. It's okay. There'll be another one, you know. But spend the time to watch the market unfold before you make the uh, the trade, right? So um, 
All right, and then you know we have to we have to find opportunities. So this is part of the process. Okay, so you recognize that what's happening right now is more important than what we think the chart's going to do. You recognize that there's no such thing as cheap or expensive. You know, um, Woolies is up two percent. The rest of the retailers are not. Woolies ended up four and a half percent that day. You could have made two and a half percent on that. That's big, even at twenty basis point to trade. You still make a two percent margin, right? That's a decent trade. You've made good money. You've made four times what your cost was. Right, so um, letting go of that, what's rational? You know, if the stock's really strong up on the day, it's up for a reason. You know, um, then the next thing is we need to now find an opportunity. So then we go through our process of finding trades, finding catalysts and news in the markets, finding like identifying trends, finding the inflection points where the trends are changing, um, that type of stuff. And also, what's very important is we need to consider where we're trading. We've got to trade where there's liquidity. We've got to trade where there's volume. Because if we're trading in stuff like blue uh, telecoms, you know, whatever you believe about the company um, is almost irrelevant. If you want to take a position, and let's say you buy 10,000 shares, and you want to sell them, and the bid is 500, 200, 1,000, you know, you want to sell your 10,000 shares, you're dead. Because you take huge amounts of slippage. So you have to trade where there's liquidity. So we'll look at that as well a little bit. Then um, using technical analysis, right, we can, um, and also order flow analysis and that type of stuff, I'm not going to get into that, but we can determine what a probabilistic outcome is going to be. So we can determine what do we think is likely to happen based on historic price information or historic market data based on the chart, right? Um, but we have to accept that that is a probabilistic outcome. So not every time... It's not going to work every time. It's only a high probability that it's going to work. The fact that it's going to, you know, anything can happen. Aliens can land and tell us that they really prefer McDonald's over uh, Burger King and McDonald's stock soars. We don't know. It could happen. Anything is possible, you know. Um, and then manage your position. Okay, so your stop loss strategy, your take profit strategy, uh, don't sit on a bad trade. You know, so the golden rules essentially is I've got them there. Uh, which is part of the manage your position, is you never you never sit on a bad trade. If a trade is not working, it might not have reached your stop loss, but you're long MTN, suddenly this news comes out, get out. You know, you can't sit. What happens a lot, it happens to me a lot, is you get trapped in a position. You take a position, you think it's going to go, it doesn't go, and now you end up sitting in that trade for the whole day, and you miss all the other opportunities around you because you're stuck in a bad trade. And you might come out square at the end of the day, but you've missed a thousand other opportunities because you're stuck in this bad position. You've got to be almost uh, like, one of the guy, like one of the guys at Storm says, possessive of your time, right? You spend time sitting at your computer looking for opportunities to make money. You can't waste hours and days and weeks in a trade that's not working because your, your time is what's making you, you could be using that time to be in a position that is working, all right? Um, and a win is over the day or the week or the month, depending on the time frame that you trade in, right? Not every single trade needs to be a winner. You don't have to win this trade, you have to win this week. You have to end up at the end of the week. You don't have to, end, you don't have to be green today. You know, it's okay to win only six out of 10 trades. It's okay to win uh, only four out of 10 trades, as long as you're winning more than, you, than you're losing. We get very, as humans, very obsessed with the need to be right because it feels good to win. And if we stop out, it feels bad. So we don't stop out. So we sit on the bad trade and this and that. It takes a bit of training to get ourselves to that point where it's like, it's okay to lose. You know, like I took a beating on Mr. Price today, but I made way more on MTN. So I was just, okay, get rid of Mr. Price. Stop, you know, just get it out. Focus where the action is MTN, you know? So it's okay to lose. You don't have to win. I think I traded a standard bank. I made a hundred bucks on that standard bank trade, but you know, I've had two winners today and two losers, but I made a decent amount of money. I wouldn't say a ton of money, but I made a good, had a good day. And of all the trades, I won like half of them, you know, so it's okay to not have to win all the time. The winning is like over a period or you have to come out the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month positive. So be okay with losing, which is a weird thing to say to people. Um, and then one round in Anglos is the same as one round in first round. Not from a percentage move perspective, I get that, but from a profit perspective. If I can make 10 bucks in this trade, 
I can make, and I can make, it's the same as making 10 bucks in that trade. Just because uh, I lost a thousand rand on first rand now, I don't need my thousand rand back from first rand. I can make it anywhere else. So it doesn't really matter what you trade. We get emotionally invested in the stocks that we trade because we feel it owes us something or because we made a lot of money in the past. It doesn't matter. We've got to find where the volume is and we've got to trade there, right? Um, so the market gives us many chances. So you can't catch all of them. They're not Pokemon, okay? Um, it's nice to think that you can take every trade and we all get in this thing where we sit and we go, okay, well, I've got to do something because I'm a trader and I've got to, it's okay. There's so many chances. You don't even have to worry about chasing them all. If you've missed them, you've missed them, okay? Um, and not everything is a chance. A lot of the time you think, you know, because you get bored and you haven't traded in like the whole week and there hasn't been any setups and nobody's got any ideas. So you start looking for things and you think, well, this must be it because the chart says so. And that's not necessarily a chance. It's just because you're bored that you're taking risk that you shouldn't be. You know, we take risk in order to get reward. So when we take risk, we must make sure that that is for the right reason, you know, instead of just doing it because we, uh, we feel we have to do something. Um, and the good traders are honest with themselves and about themselves. So if you're in a position that's going against you, you can say all the positive things you want about the company. The fact is the position is going against you, right? You have to be honest enough with yourself to say I was wrong. Um, again, quoting one of the guys from Storm, if you look in the mirror and you're ugly, you can't say, oh, I'm so handsome when you're ugly, <laughs> right? You should be honest enough with yourself to say, shit, I'm really ugly. You know, maybe I should buy a hat or whatever the case is. Um, so you've got to be honest enough with yourself to admit when you're wrong, which is the which is the hard part, right? Um, you can't talk a bad trade good. There's nothing, no amount of lip service is going to make the stock go up. The market is so much bigger than we all are. So, um, and if you can get out, you can get you know if you can get out, if you can get back in, get out. So for example, you're in a position that goes up in your favor really strong, you kind of get a little nervous and whatever, and it starts to consolidate a little bit, and you think, shit, you know, I'm going to take the money, take the money. Get out. If it breaks higher, you can get back in, right? There's no nothing stopping you. But if you feel that you um, – but then you have to have the resolve to get back in as well. But a lot of the time what we do is we don't want to get out because we're scared that we're going to miss the bus. So it goes up maybe 3% in our favor. And then we don't get out of the trade because we think, well, it's going to go, the chart says it's going to go another four rand up or whatever the case is. But it looks like it's struggling. And then just take the money. If it breaks the resistance and it keeps going, buy it back. You know, but if it doesn't, then at least you've put something in your pocket. Now you sit and you watch it go all the way back down to entry and crap. So if you can get up, if you can get back in, get out now. And if it keeps going in your direction, get back in. You know, there's no, the transaction fees are, a problem, I know, but they're not that high that it's that it's unreasonable to uh, to consider. You know, you're a trader. You're you can get in and out of the market. That's what we do. So it's not the end of the world. Okay. Any questions up to this point before I go any further? All right. Okay. So technical setups. Some of you might recognize the Aussie. Yeah? Um, so a couple of things before we get into some of the setups. Um, as I said earlier, technical setup or technical well, setup, I guess, uh, represents just a probabilistic outcome of a historic series of events, right? So one thing is more likely to happen over another. That's uh, pretty much all it represents to us. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to take a measured and controlled amount of risk. So we can, with that set risk management rules, stop loss levels, risk reward ratios, that kind of stuff. It's an opportunity for us to assume risk to take money, right? But it's just a probabilistic forecast of what might happen. Okay, so it's not always right. So uh, as I said earlier, it's a visual representation um, of what the market is doing, of price action, and it's an attempt to understand the emotional state of the market. And that's why uh, I suggest it's, you know, it's important that you watch the market for a while before you get into a trade. Um, you can't just sit down and go, ooh, I mean, I did it this afternoon as soon as I walked in here, but I got lucky, <laughs> you know? Um, the, the truth is you've got to sit and you've got to just feel the market just for a little bit. Let it breathe, let it 
you know, and if you miss the chance while you're watching it, then you've missed the chance, you know, next, there'll be another one tomorrow, another one next week. Um, and charts are not always in isolation, you have to watch volume, okay, now, on a lot of these charts, I don't include volume, but um, what is important, if you have on your trading platform, you've probably got like a trade history view, right, so put that on. And then if you see that it gets to certain levels and the trade history speeds up, the number of trades going through speeds up, then you know, okay, that's significant. So if there's a breakout and there's tons of volume going through and the price breaks through a resistance level, then you on the, then you can take, you're on the right side of the trade. You've got to allow the volume to be there as well. Because if there's no volume on the breakout, it's not actually a breakout. It's just one person who panicked, pushed the price up 50 cents, psych, comes back down, you know. You need someone to step in and follow through. So think about it from this perspective. Moves like this, this is a one minute chart by the way, um, moves like this that happen, these are big institutional people. The market is moved by institutions, right? So some guy at, uh, you know, JP Morgan gets a phone call from Coronation and they say to him, buy me a million MTNs today. And he sits and he starts buying, boom, 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 boom. And he's the guy pushing the stock up, all right? So if there's no volume, there's no price movement. Or you have these crazy erratic movements that's 5% up, 3% down, crazy, but on zero volume. So you can't take positions because if you take 500 shares and the thing moves three bucks against you and then three months, three bucks up and then four ran down, I mean, it's emotional turmoil. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not viable in, in condition to, to trade in, right? So you have to trade where there's, where there's volume. So anyway, okay. So looking at some setups, this is a intraday setup for the guys who like to trade the really, really short term stuff. So what happens is in the mornings when the market opens, there's generally two times in the day that the, the most volume is being traded, which is mornings uh, and in the evenings. I'm just going to check the time because I want to see. Okay, so in the mornings at about uh, 9 o'clock the market opens. And there's obviously a ton of volume that gets traded during that time. And then in the closing uh, sort of half an hour of the day, there's a lot of volume as well. So the biggest moves that happen on any given day happen in the morning. That first hour, two hours is when the big move happens. Even if you look at MTN today, it opened low, bounced up a little, and then hammered down, bounced back, sort of went sideways for a bit and then came and broke the lows later in the afternoon. But the really big fast move, the 22% was done by this morning. You know, um, by 10 o'clock it was, it had bottomed out and bounced. So, um, so that is this representation. Okay, so this really big move happens in the morning. Now this is broken down even quicker, right? So what we're looking for is a potential trade setup that we can do is we're not always able to sell in the opening auction and catch all of the move, right? So when we see, for example, or you can inverse this and it runs the other way, it runs, can work up as well. But basically what we're doing here is we're looking for a pullback of that initial move. So the market opens and makes a big move. Then we need that move to pull back a little bit, not all the way to the top. If it pulls back all the way to the top or where it came, where it came from or where it started, then that doesn't count as a pullback, okay? It's got to pull back up to half, up to 61% or whatever. You can use your Fibonacci's there. It's got to be a pullback of that move, not a complete retracement of the move, right? Followed by a consolidation. So price goes sideways for a while. And then a break in the direction of the original move. Okay, so to get a bit technical, this is an impulse wave, right? This is a retracement wave, then a consolidation or a pullback, right, then a consolidation, and then a break in the direction of the consolidation. And you're looking to trade this break of that consolidation. Okay, questions? None. Okay. So, um, so basically, how you would trade something like this is you'd wait for this first move to take place. Now, you could argue that this is a consolidation as well, and then it breaks a bit further lower, right? So you, but... Ultimately, it's the same move. You could try and trade this breakout, but that's maybe a bit risky because you'd want this to bounce first a little bit and then trace. It doesn't bounce. It keeps coming down, consolidates here for a bit, bounces, makes the retracement, and then consolidates. And now you start seeing 
long sort of wicks on the candles and stuff. So it's starting to feel like they're trying to get it up, but they can't. That's why it's consolidating here. So what's happening is there's probably a seller that's sitting at that level. The same guy that pushed it down, take his foot off the gas for a bit. It bounces up a, a couple of percent or a couple of rand or whatever the, the stock is that you're trading. Um, and then as the buyers try to lift into that seller, he's still there. Eventually they run out of steam and the seller's forced now to step down and start selling again because no one else is left to buy it from him and you want to then trade that wave on the way down. So you're basically trading that break of that consolidation on the, on the pullback, right? So uh, how you would trade this is you would put your stop at the top of this consolidation area. So I'm calling, I'm gonna refer to this uh, throughout the thing as the consolidation extreme. So if you are trading the consolidation break up, the consolidation extreme is the bottom end of it. If you're trading the consolidation down, the extreme is the top of it, right? Um, and as a, as a take profit strategy, you can use a trailing stop loss or you can use uh, the next consolidation. So if you see that it starts hitting a bit of support, because in this case it's a short, if you see it starts hitting a bit of support, that's your ticket to get out. If it breaks further, get back in until the next sort of support and then you get out again, right? Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Can you actually put a stop loss on or are you talking about emotional stop loss? Well, the way that I trade is, uh, I don't, you, well, you can with most retail platforms, you can put a stop loss on, yes. Um, I've seen sometimes say two ten is a stop loss. Well, you might never see that. It goes straight through. From so this is a yeah. This is a, a product of the liquidity in the in the market, right? So on a day like today, where MTN traded by four o'clock, something like forty two million shares, that slippage isn't really going to happen because there's enough volume for you to get out, right? But on a very illiquid stock like um, sign up's been actually quite quite nice over the last couple of years. Let's use Telcom, okay? So on something like Telcom, your stop loss might be at 10 Rand and 5 cents, but if it trades 10 Rand and 5 cents and you're short and the next offer is at 10 Rand and 50 cents, your stop loss enters as a market order and is going to hit the 50. It's going to buy the first thing in sight. That's where you get that slippage. And that's why uh, we'll go through finding trades just now, why it's important to trade in stuff where there's liquidity so that that doesn't happen. And that's what's scary sometimes is you sit, I mean, the other day I was complaining, I was long something like four and a half thousand woolly shares and the spread is 50 cents big. And there's 500, 200, 700, these are the bids and they range down a buck. And I've got to, if I want to fill my four and a half thousand shares, I've got to push the price down around. I mean, that is, so you can put your stop loss, but it might not necessarily uh, be able to be filled at the price that your level is at, if that makes sense. So um, so when I sort of intraday trade, I don't have automated stop losses that I use. I sit and I watch it. Um, and if it gets to my level, I'll try to get out as, as quick as I can, you know. Um, but okay, yeah, and then uh, this pattern sort of occurs on multiple time frames. Okay, so this is the basis of how trends are formed. So it moves, or let's use a bullish trend, it goes up, it consolidates, it pulls back, it consolidates, it goes up, consolidates. So those impulses and retracements is what you're looking for. And your trigger to get in on them is the break of the consolidation, right? So what a lot of people will do is they'll draw a trend line here and say, if it touches the trend line, you go short. The trend line isn't necessarily the place to do it. The support and resistance levels aren't exact numbers. They're zones where buyers and sellers come to market. So you have to watch it around that level. And if it consolidates there and it breaks that consolidation, then you have a trade. So a lot of this is today is based on consolidation breaks, ironically. Um, so th that one's called an impulse consolidation pullback. Okay, so impulse, the pullback consolidation break. Okay, um, reversal consolidation breakout. <laughs> Fancy long names, eh? That's what the internet calls them. So what we have here is we've got a decent uptrend um, into a consolidation and then a further breakout. Okay. So we're going to call this an impulse wave, consolidation, another impulse wave. Now we're looking for a, con a pullback, consolidation, and a break, right? But we now have a, re a pullback that is as big as our previous wave. Okay, so this is no longer a pullback. Because it is the same size as the wave that went up, it is, or the move that went up, it's the same size down, it now becomes an impulse wave. 
right? Does that make sense? Um, we then see the retracement up. It, if it goes all the way up to this high, it's not a retracement or a pullback. But because it only makes it about halfway, 60% of the way, that we can now consider as a pullback. Again, followed by a consolidation, a very tight consolidation. So we see this battle between the two opposing forces. The consolidation breaks below the level. And you can literally set it to like, if the, if the buyer, for example, um, is at 53 Rand, okay? Bounces of 53, bounces of 53 the whole time. If that thing goes offered, if you watch the bid and offer, it goes offered at 53 and bid at uh, uh, 52.99, you hit that bid. 52.99, you take it. As, as, if you can take all of it, you take all of it because that's it, the buyer's done. Consolidation breaks, and down she comes, right? Um, and again, similar thing, you can use a trailing stop loss. Um, or you can aim for the next consolidation. Trailing stop loss, what I like to do is just use a trend line. You know, so you just connect a couple of these candles, there's your trend line, as soon as that trend line breaks, you're out. Um, yeah, I guess you could call it head and shoulders, yeah? Because then they, they would, that would be your neckline there. Yeah. So, well, so, uh, uh, it all comes down to lateral and, and like well, horizontal support, actually. So the head and shoulders break is horizontal support. Uh, we'll look at a cup and handle just now. That's also concept, that horizontal support. So that's really it. The, like, um, okay, we'll, we'll get to the rest of the stuff now. So reversals at support and resistance levels, also from an intraday perspective. So uh, this is this chart that continues. Okay. So we have this move, our reverse, our our, our uh, pullback consolidation breakout. Um, then we have a bit of a consolidation here. It gets a bit messy, but move up now to this previous resistance level. So a new impulse wave, a consolidation, a breakout down, down to resistance, a consolidation, a breakout up. Okay, so when you're trading horizontal support and resistance levels, is what I was saying earlier, is like don't put your bid or your offer in on exactly the level. Wait a while, watch the market, see how it behaves around that support or resistance level. See how much it consolidates, how tight that consolidation is. And then when that consolidation breaks, then you have a trade. Okay. And again, your stop loss is then below the consolidation extreme or above the consolidation extreme. And your target is whatever the top of the range is and or a trailing stop. Okay. Any questions? I'm going to keep doing that so that I know you guys are... Are with me. I don't want anyone. <laughs> I want to make sure that you guys uh, at least get some sort of value, you know. Um, so purposefully, I've taken the, the stock names out. Um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you later what this is. So horizontal result support and resistance is the most powerful of all the support and resistance levels. So we look at trend lines and all sorts of things that offer resistance, but the horizontal stuff is really the levels. Okay, so. Um, Again, the big volume is traded in generally at the round numbers. The banks, the coronation says to the bank, I want harmony at 19 rand 50. You buy anything you can get at that level. That's why there's a spot level, because there's a big order sitting, right? Um, so you have a consolidation around, uh, a, so this is actually a stock that's trading in a channel, okay? So you identify the support and resistance zone on a daily chart, and it's going sideways. MTN's been doing this now for a little while. Um, and it's going up and down in this channel that is trading sideways. Okay? Um, every time it comes down to the bottom of the channel, you switch to a shorter time frame. So you switch from a daily ch chart to a one-hour chart. All right? And this is now the one-hour chart of the stock we're looking at. And we see that it's now consolidating around this level until eventually it breaks out. And notice there's volume on the breakout. So when the stock breaks out, suddenly the volume picks up. So every hour it's trading, uh, I don't know, 250,000 shares an hour. And suddenly it trades 500,000 shares in that hour. And it's easy to see because you're using a volume indicator. And that's when the stock breaks out of this consolidation. So that's your long trigger, right? And your, your stop loss is below your consolidation low or your consolidation extreme. And your, your, your target is either a trailing stop the next consolidation, or um, the top of the trend line. So maybe what I'm doing 
is throwing the idea of risk reward ratios out a little bit because you not have you don't have set targets right with consolidations with bigger channels and stuff it's easier to do so the idea is you identify the channel on the daily chart and then you look at the for the consolidations around the support and resistance on one hour charts or 30 minute charts and when they break there those are your triggers to take the daily trades on the on the big channels right so you see this one worked out lacquer, went all the way to the top, consolidated again, broke out, okay, it retraced all the way, tested it, came all the way down, consolidated again. And look at this consolidation, look at the volume that's trading there in this block. Right, so you know every time it's coming down there, there's big volume, big volume, big volume, big volume, big volume, and then it breaks out the top of the consolidation. Okay, your stop is at the bottom of the consolidation extreme, so you're not stopped out there. So you took the trade when it broke out of this when it broke out of this block. Okay? And that's where we are at the moment. And this is the chart on the daily. So this is a harmony, actually. That's been going sideways for a while. So it's just trading in this range, 28 to 1950, um, which is huge in percentage terms. And you've got really nice sort of setups here. You can trade that with a stop loss, very small stop for a very big reward. Right? You don't know what the reward's going to be. You might get out in that consolidation there, or you might get out, see the consolidation break up, and get back in. It's okay to trade two or three times in and out while the market's going. We'll never get the whole move, sure, but we can try and take out pieces of it as it's moving. Okay. Um, then false breakouts confirm trades. Okay. So if we're watching this is now our uh, uptrend, We've got our most recent impulse move, which is negated. So we've got a new impulse move. This is now a pullback. So we know that this is forming. Up to this point, if we're just watching this chart, we know that this is forming. We've seen this come down. Okay, that's a new impulse. Making a pullback, making a pullback. And here, that now breaks up, which negates the fact that this is a pullback. But it breaks up a little bit for on a five-minute chart or on a one-hour chart, and it comes all the way back down. And we look at volume. Oh, there was no significant volume on that breakout. So... It's a fake breakout. This is just confirmed. Okay, this is the pullback. The short is on. So fake breakouts are very often uh, indicators that um, that there's a reversal coming. Okay. That's basically based on the volume. Then. It's, a, it's based on or volume. In this, scenario. in this scenario, it's based on volume. There's another one I'll show you, Nana, with a triangle where there's a fake breakout. Um, there's no volume on that chart either, but um, You'll see, like it's a it's a confirmation that there's uh, no support for that particular direction, um, and this stuff happens all the time on ranges and with support and resistance level. People get stopped, uh, get stuck in fake breakouts. Everybody goes in long and comes straight back. And the way to avoid that is to not trade the level, but to trade the consolidation around that level on a shorter time frame. Okay. Uh, okay. Triangles, wedges. Uh, and the like. So three basic triangles that you get. Now I have to say the triangles are not as effective as one might think. Um, I know that everybody loves triangles and always draws, oh there's a wedge and the triangle and this and that. They're a lot less reliable than you think, although they are still around 72 to 78 percent accurate, believe it or not. Um, but the same statistic is said for a head and shoulders to be 89 percent accurate and I tell you it's not. Okay, so um, but in any case, let's look at them. So the basis of a triangle is that the price moves into, so you get three different types, flat top, flat bottom, and symmetrical, or ascending, descending, and symmetrical. Okay? Flat top is bullish, so your expectation is for them to break higher. Flat bottom is bearish, your expectation is for them to break lower. And a symmetrical triangle, also known as a pennant, um, is 50-50, uh, whichever, whichever way it goes. So these can be... Uh, that can be both trend continuation and trend reversal. These are usually continuation trends, trend continuation patterns. But they do have the opportunity to go the other way as well. So as we know, it's a probabilistic outcome, not a guaranteed outcome. A flat top triangle that breaks down is very bearish because the anticipation is that they uh, trade up. So other traders who are who we are making money from uh, are expecting it to trade higher, so they position themselves for it to trade higher, it breaks lower, it collapses, okay, because all those guys have to get out, 
and they're the ones pushing the price down. Um, so again, don't just trade it when it breaks out. Wait for a consolidation around the level before it breaks uh, out. But what you would do here is you would stop loss, for example, on the ascending trial, you would stop loss just below this bottom trend line. Uh, and your target is basically you measure this piece. So not the complete in move, sort of that first retracement from the top of the triangle down to the bottom. That would be your projected out. Same applies on all of them, really. So not the in move, the first move to the top, but that first movement after the initial sort of resistance, that first retracement. So you're trying to measure that really broadest part of the wedge. Um, and that would be your, your target out. Uh, and your stop loss is obviously if it if it fails to to break out in the direction that you thought it would. But you you can't just stop loss right at the top of this thing because if it comes back in a test, it might come and test this bottom level again and then go, and then you've stopped out at the top right where your entry is and you've missed the bus. So you've got to stop below the formation. If that makes sense. Okay, and then I've got a practical example here of a nice little flat bottom. I realize now that you can't see that blue line, so lacquer on this thing. But there's a little little flat bottom triangle. It's closed below your level. Uh, this is a daily chart, and then it just boogies all the way down. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the entry was the close of that candle. Um, stop loss above your trend line, and take profit in the next consolidation area. Okay, then looking at uh, sort of the textbook examples, if you will, there's your fake breakout, right? And this volume here trades a few days later. So that fake breakout was on like hardly any volume. So you see there's no like, so there's no, so you think, okay, this is it, it's going. But if you look at that day, let's see if I can follow it all the way down. It's like here somewhere. So one of these lower than average volume days was the breakout. And they closed it on the high. Well, not quite the high, but the closer the closer the high. So it tells you that, I don't know, maybe the market lost its mind for that day, but you can't trust that signal because there's no real volume. Then on a big red day, on a red day, you see big volume. Okay, now we know the real direction of this thing. It comes all the way down to test level. Um, so in any case, it's just an example of a nice face, fake breakout. But um, again, you want a consolidation before a breakout, before you trade the, the triangle. And this slide I put in here, Actually, sort of as a to prove that these things aren't so easy to trade. Okay, so this looks like the perfect setup. Wow, you caught this thing. I mean, it's easy, right? There's your there's your uh, rising wedge, which is a, uh, a bearish signal, and it breaks down and it goes. But where would you get in on this thing? Like that closed on the level. The next day it closed below. So now you think, is it a fake break breakout? Is it not? Uh, then there's a bit of a consolidation. Okay, fine. You could pr pr trade that consolidation break because it's around your support level, but it's so far below the support level that it doesn't really count. You know, so it's easy to look at the chart in retrospect and go, "Geez, that was so obvious." But if you only see up to that point, it's almost impossible to know whether or not you you're right or not. So this is why the horizontal or the the curved not curved but the slanted sort of support and resistance levels um, are very difficult to trade is where the horizontal levels are a lot stronger. <laughs> okay, So uh, a nice example of triangles that actually work. Um, we've got a nice symmetrical triangle here. Uh, this is uh, Brent crude oil. Um, it breaks out and it just boogies all the way up. And then we have a bull flag, OK, which is what, oh, right, yeah, I forgot. So uh, there's a number of things happening here as well. So um, what we have here is lower. I mean, higher lows and lower lows on the stochastic. All right, so that's called divergence. So this is a nice thing where you start looking for multiple things telling you to take a trade. Okay, so you've got a triangle here that is breaking out. There is a consolidation that breaks uh, at the top there. You can go down in shorter time frames, and you can see on the one hour it's a beautiful consolidation. It breaks the consolidation and the triangle at the same time. So that's your trigger to go long. Plus. What you have here is the price is making higher lows, so it's trending up. And your stochastic oscillator has, over that same period, made lower lows. Right? So that is something called bullish or inverse bullish divergence. I think that's what it's called. I'm not 100% sure. The next slide will tell me. Um, after that, we have a move up into a bull flag. And what is looking like a bit of a breakout, but we'll have to wait a few days to see, because we have actually got some bearish divergence over there. So that high is higher than that high, 
uh, that high is lower than that high, and that high is higher than that high. So you've got uh, a bit of divergence. So it's a bit of a warning signal that this bull flag might not work, or it might not be a bull flag. It's a nice setup, though. Um, okay, so let's look at divergence. So there's a couple of different uh, divergences you get. Uh, I'm going to go through all of them. Normal bullish divergence, normal bearish divergence, reverse or hidden divergence on both bullish and bearish. Okay. So basically, what we have is we have price at the top and an oscillator of sorts at the bottom. So some people use RSI. I like to use a stochastic, and I use just a standard normal stochastic. I don't change it. I just put on whatever the normal settings is for the platform I'm using. I think it's 14 seven or whatever, I don't know what it is. Um, and that's what I use, okay? Um, a lot of guys are gonna time adjust your thing and say, no, you gotta use this setting and that setting and use some of three of them at the same time and it's overkill, okay? Keep it simple. So basically what happens is it, uh, whether it's the stochastic oscillator or the relative strength indicator, um, it tries to measure the strength of the trend based on a mathematical formula and it plots a course between zero and 100, right? and that oscillates as price moves up and down. So what happens sometimes is that with uh, bullish divergence, you have price making lower lows, so it's trending down, but your oscillator is not participating in that much downside. So it makes a new low on the price, but it doesn't make a new low on the oscillator. It makes a lower, it makes a higher low on the oscillator. So that, if you look, uh, okay, that's not the example here, but that is a bullish reversal signal. So if you've got some sort of a reversal pattern, like a, a, um, like a rising wedge or a you know like a pennant or like a nice channel that looks like a thing or a head and shoulders, and you see that inverse head and shoulders, for example, with Burkwell, and you see that, that's secondary confirmation that there is a case to be bullish, right? Um, if you look at the reverse bullish divergence, which is what is the case here, you've got higher lows on your price, but you've got lower lows on your oscillator. So that's like an elastic pulling back to rocket the thing up, which is exactly what happens here. You've got lower lows here, you've got higher lows there, and it's, uh, it leads to a bullish move. On the opposite side, the bearish moves, you've got higher highs on your price um, and lower highs on your oscillator. This, this one is the most common when it comes to bullish setups, and this one is the most common when it comes to bearish setups, all that I've seen at least. Um, so you've got uh, price sort of trending up, making higher highs the whole time, but your oscillator fails to make that second higher high. It comes, it falls a little short, makes a low high. So you've got that divergence. Combine that with a bearish setup or a reversal pattern, and you've got uh, a formula for a good time. Okay, uh, and then reverse or hidden bearish divergence, which is pretty much the inverse. The, um, so these are trend continuation. Uh, yeah. No, trend reversal, trend continuation, uh, trend reversal, trend continuation. Okay, so this is a um, uh, sort of bearish because you've got the lower lows, the whole, lower highs the whole time, and your oscillator is making higher, higher highs. So that's sort of like a think of it like an elastic that you pull back, and it's pen, pending up energy, pulling more and more and more energy into the next move down, and the price is failing to build that same momentum up. The energy in the market is increasing and it fails to make a new high, so it comes down and all that energy is released on the way down. Questions? Cool. Um, okay, I'm gonna check on the time. Flags and channels. So uh, looking at like a channel and a flag is pretty much the same thing. The differences between them was time frame. Okay, so a bull flag or a bear flag is basically a channel that it's trading in a rising or a, a, a ascending or descending channel. Okay, so now you've got two choices. You can trade in the channel, or you can trade the breakout of the channel, depending on the time frame and how much, uh, how long you want to wait. But essentially, they are uh, the same thing. So a bull flag, for example, um, has this nice move up, consolidates in the flag formation and breaks out. Bear flag is obviously the, the opposite to this. And the way to trade them is basically you measure this flag pole from the base of where it starts to the very tip of the uh, the flag, the actual flag, which is the specie, and you you project that out from the bottom flag all the way to the top. So that's how you set your targets for it. Again, your uh, stop loss is then at the lows of the of the flag formation. 
and vice versa if you're going the other way. Um, if you are trading a channel, right? So this is a bear flag, correct? But it is simultaneously a channel. So what I've done here is this is actually a daily chart. So this is a very long time that's that's passed. And believe it or not, it's actually broken out at the top now. I don't know what it's doing today. It might have been a fake breakout. We don't know. This is the S&P 500. Okay. You can see what I've done is I've put in three lines rather than just two. Okay. So basically, the first thing I look for is the uh, support levels. And you can't see it's so a lack on the chart yet, but it's a solid line up to about here. And then it's a dotted line, which means that is all projected. So when I drew this chart in, I had data up to here, right? Which is pretty much where the solid line ends. And I copy that, I paste it at the bottom, it fits in nicely. So you've got your channel that is trading in or your flag formation, right? In the beginning, I thought it was a flag because it looks like a flag, right? Or up to here, it looks like a flag. So what I then do is I then look for a significant support and resistance level in the middle and more often than not <laughs> you can go do this more often than not it is smack in the middle that is equidistant between the two right now you've got three support and resistance levels that you can trade from so you look for consolidations around the top to trade it lower a consolidation here could get you out of the trade if it consolidate and breaks lower you can then go to your next support level and then you can trade that channel line until eventually it either breaks down the bottom you get short for your life what breaks out the top, which is incredibly bullish, right? So, um, but yeah, so that's basically the premise of, of trading a channel. Obviously, that works in a sideways channel as well. Um, sideways channels, I don't draw the middle line. I just do the tops and bottoms. With the slanted channels, I'd like to draw the middle line because often you'll see it has a relationship with that middle line where it doesn't make it all the way down to the bottom um, or doesn't make it all the way to the top for a long time and it breaks through that and it runs to the top channel. So there's a, it's like a, I think you call it a St. Andrew's pitchfork is a technical tool that you use to draw these. I drew them, I draw them manually. But again, um, look for consolidations around the support and resistance levels, which is uh, what we're going to be doing. Um, then reversal patterns, we've got cup and handle. I think you guys are all familiar with this, right? Uh, we have technically what's a rounding bottom, um, and then a smaller little one. So what you could also, you could probably say that is an inverse head and shoulders, right, if you include this piece of it. But basically it's like it forms like a cup of tea or whatever. Um, and what's happening here is this is a horizontal resistance level that is going to break. So there's someone sitting here selling the stock. They sell it all the way down over a period of days, weeks, months, whatever. Comes all the way back, oh, sell is still there, comes down a little bit, the market is so anxious for it, they want more of it, so they don't allow it to pull back all the way, and then they come back, and if they break through that level, then that's a, uh, quite a bullish sign. It does happen the other way around, but usually it's a, a bullish reversal pattern. Uh, the cup, the, what is it called? Cup and handle, thank you. Uh, head and shoulders, um, again, is more really about the horizontal level. So here, yeah, this one's interesting because this is a double top, but it's also a head with the shoulders, right? Um, and then your neckline, where's my pointer? The neckline is there, which it hasn't yet broken. So I guess this stands as a testament that even though it's a head and shoulders, technically it's valid, it doesn't work like, oh, it's there, it's going to break immediately. It can go sideways for a long time, it can fail. Um, what is important, I think, to watch here is what you don't see is you see the high volume at the beginning of the channel of the formation, and as the formation comes to an end, volume tapers down, right? And that is usually a good sign that there's um, disinterest in this, in the price going any higher. So every time they push it up, there's a little bit of volume. It comes down. They push it up again, even higher. There's a little, a little bit of volume, but a little bit less than there was before. Then it pulls back, finds support, pushes for the third shot for the third time, hoping to get higher doesn't, this is now when it forms the, the next shoulder and there's even less volume and that's your, okay, there's trouble here, there's not enough momentum to, to push it up, then you wait for that horizontal level to break and you hit it. Um, and this is something for the longer term folks, okay? This is purely technical um, and you can do it on pretty much any asset class, uh, any commodity or stock, whatever the case is. It's a daily chart with a 200-day moving average, which is the blue line, 
and a 50 and a 100 day uh, moving average, just normal simple moving averages. What you're looking for is a crossover of the 50 and the 100 day moving average while it's underneath the 200 day moving average. If it's above the 200 day moving average, no go, it's not a signal. So you're looking for things that are making long term trend reversals or medium term trend reversals, okay? So it does give fake signals. You'll see there is the, uh, it gets you long in there and it crosses again so it gets you out. But eventually when it does cross, it crosses both, so it's important, both price and uh, the two moving averages need to be below the 200. Okay, so here we have a crossover. Price is below the 200. Um, it's tested the 200. It's come back down. It's made, it made a crossover. Price is below 200. The two moving averages have crossed over below the 200. And boom, we're off to the races. Okay, so that's a medium-term trend. This is 2012, 2013. I mean, 2014 It's a long period of time. Okay, so you're going to be, these are not really trades that we're going to be doing intraday. These are going to be medium-term investments. Um, as we can see here again, there's an opportunity to get in. It rallies up really nicely. And this is actually where we are now. And this is coffee, coffee futures, commodity. Right? So at some point, believe it or not, uh, this is almost, not historic lows, but decade lows, multi-decade lows. Um, at some point, we'll have that crossover happen, and that's our buy signal. And we get it. Interesting also, what's happening here is what happened to oil uh, a couple of years ago, where the cost of producing coffee is currently more expensive than the coffee price, which is unsustainable. So they will remove production. A whole bunch of things will happen, and we'll have a readjustment. And coffee should, in theory, over the next three or four years, have one hell of a rally. But first, we want a proper buy signal. Mark, sorry. Yes. If I make a Oh, on this on this strategy, yeah. yeah, yeah just, just so what you could do is you could use another crossover as your exit of your 50 and 100, um, or you could just use a trailing stop. Trailing stop would probably be a lot better. So you'd use something like an ATR times two trailing stop. Now I did include the slides from a while ago um, at the end if you want to talk about stop losses. Okay, cool. Uh, then finding trades. I realize I'm pretty much out of time. So I will hurry. Um, so finding trades, we'll spend a little bit of time on this. It's not uh, the bulk of it. The key here is to trade in liquid stuff. Okay, so if you're going to trade on the JSC, you trade in the top 40. I know it is terribly exciting and uh, tempting to trade Steinoff. But you know what? Steinoff, <laughs> Steinoff isn't in the top 40 anymore. So leave it alone. Right? Trade top 40 stocks. The reason that they are in the top 40 is because they are the biggest companies, with the biggest market caps, and the most liquidity. Right? You don't want to have 50 cent or 3% slippage on your stop losses. You want to be able to get in and out of the market with ease. And that means you have to trade where there's volume, where there's liquidity, where there's other people trading. Because if you're the only guy trying to buy, uh, what's a good example? Signia. Right? Maybe I shouldn't use that example. Stay away. Stay away. All right. But if you're the only guy trying to trade, uh, you can trade Krugerrands in the exchange. Okay? Yeah. You can't actually trade them. I mean, they trade one every couple of weeks. So you can't, you know, you've got to trade where there's liquidity. Something like First Trend trades 5 million shares a day. You can get in and out 10,000 shares, 4,000, 2,500 easily. But try and move around 10,000 telecoms, yeah, you're going to struggle. You know, um, so it's not so, so trade with the liquidity. So if you're trading on the JSE, trade in the top 40, only the top 40. If you want to trade stocks in other, on other exchanges, trade stuff that's in the S&P 500 or trade stuff that's in the Dow Jones Industrial Average or on the FTSE 100. Trade stuff that's in the major index for that country. Don't trade stuff on the peripheries. Okay. Uh, indices, the same sort of goes for the major indices. You can trade the MIB, Italian index and stuff, but the truth is it's not as liquid as the DAX. So you're going to have 5 6% moves in a day on the MIB index, which is not unheard of. It happens more often than you think. And then if you're on the wrong side of that, you're going to die. So trade where there's liquidity for you to be able to get in and out of stuff. And the same with currency pairs. You know, We all want to trade the Rand dollar, but don't. <laughs> you know, It is ironically the eighth most liquid pair in the world, but it is not as liquid as the euro dollar or the pound yen, or any of those things. So you trade the major pairs. Same with commodities. You can trade orange juice 
stuff if you really must, but it's better to trade gold, you know, because that's where a lot of people are, are trading. I think, and I stand corrected, or, you know, I might stand corrected here, but I think the most liquid instrument on IG is the DAX. You know, so trade the DAX or trade the Aussie. You know, don't trade some bloody index of a country you've never heard of because, hey, you've heard cool stories. There's no... There's no liquidity there, right? You've got to trade where, the, where, the, where there's liquidity. So, And finding the trades is really a routine that you set up for yourself. So it's a daily process. So like I said before, spend time watching the market. Set aside or put it on. I mean, I know we all have jobs. So put it on the side of your screen and let it run. Watch a 10-minute chart or a 5-minute chart just for the day. And You don't have to sit there and watch it. I know it's tempting. But just be aware of the fact that what's happening to the Aussie the whole day. Okay, that's trading up. Oh, I was trading down. You don't have to be involved to be aware of what the market is doing. You know, you can be aware of, okay, it's now come up for the third time to this area today. Maybe there is a trade. You know, let me look. Okay, it's consolidating. Okay, yeah. Set a trigger on your thing. If it breaks this level, make a noise. You know? So you have to, it's a process. You have to go through the charts every day. You can't just get to your desk and go, hmm. Someone was talking about MTN. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a setup, you know. Um, and also, Google stuff. If you're going to trade first round, you know, Google news around first round. If you want to trade Nusbash, Google news around Nusbash. You'll find things. Oh, upcoming results. Oh, expectations this. Expectation. Oh, shit, okay, maybe I shouldn't take longs now. Or maybe I shouldn't take shorts now. Or maybe I should just wait for the news. You know, just find out what's happening in the companies before you trade them. Um, because a lot of the time we get blindsided by stuff we didn't know or didn't expect. And we go, oh, well, it's the stock market. It's unpredictable. Well, you know, if you look at an earnings calendar, you might have known that this was coming. <laughs> you know, results day, due tomorrow. You know, so wait maybe a day before you take a trade. Um, so, and start with a small universe of stuff and then work into a bigger universe as you become more acquainted with the, with the market. So there's is, cool. Then we need to search for potential catalysts. Now, I cannot stress how important this is because if you look at something like today, MTN was free money. The other day, Nasbash was free money. Why? Because there's a catalyst in the market. Okay, so a setup can be as good as it can be. And often, you know, if you look at a chart, the, we were talking about it in the office the other day, oh, well, if this support level at 103 breaks, this thing can go down like 60 bucks. Yeah, boom, there's a catalyst suddenly in the market and the thing drops to like 81 at some point during the course of today. And we've done, done most of the move because there's fresh news. Okay, so you've got to be aware of that. You've got to Google stuff. You've got to be aware of news, upcoming events, that kind of stuff because a catalyst can change everything, right? And so you make use of tools, economic calendars, uh, company uh, results calendars. Most, of, most stockbrokers uh, that you have, uh, that you make use of, give you access to a research portal. Uh, where there is a research, uh, where there's a company results calendar. Go look at that every day and make take note. Oh, you know, Willie's is reporting today. Okay. Watch out for the sends. Read the sends. You know, find out if it's going good, if it's not. See if you can find any news on Google Finance about what the market expectations were, consensus expectations or whatever. See whether it's a beat or not. Those things can create opportunities for you. Okay. Um, late night cabinet reshuffles, for example. Is a good one. Um, Trump speeches, that kind of stuff. Read the newspaper. Uh, talk to other traders and build a network. So have other people you can chat to during the day. Skype is an incredible tool. Um, I can't even tell you how many chat rooms I'm in. It's unbelievable the amount of people that I talk to in a day. Did you see this? Did you see that? Da, 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 da. Okay, guys. Oh, you didn't hear that. You know, we share information. We create. We generate ideas. We, you know, ten eyes are better than one, or ten pairs of eyes are better than one pair of eyes because. You've got some guy watching Steinoff the whole day. Someone else is watching MTN. I'm busy watching first round. If I see something, I say it. If they see something, they say it. And you work together. So it's important to have a network of people that you, uh, that you talk to. And again, you don't always have to be in a trade. We get in this, this thing where we go, well, you know, I'm supposed to be trading. So if I'm not long, I'm short. You know? No. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Sometimes you can just chill for weeks and there's nothing happening. And there's no opportunity, especially now. If you've noticed, volumes through the JSE, I mean, we've been having good days of 15 billion rand. I mean, that's ridiculous. Three, four years ago, a good day was 30 billion rand. You know, now we're doing 11 million, sometimes like 11 billion on, a, on like a bad day, 
the, yesterday we did 18. Today we were at 18 by 4 o'clock, so we had a decent day today, but that's because of the MTN. So there's, um, so you know, the, the, because the conditions in which we trade aren't always conducive for us to make money. If there's no liquidity or volume in the market, there's nothing happening. You sit there and you're watching paint dry and you get bored, so you force a trade and you lose money. You know, so be patient. You can miss chances, there'll be more, but you can't undo mistakes a lot of the time. Right? The market has to work for you, not you for the market. So it is something that you can afford to sit for a week and not lose money, right? Because spending a week losing money is a lot more expensive than just waiting for the right opportunity and the right setup. And even if you have to watch the same setup unfold 10 times on a five minute chart or a one hour chart or a daily chart before you actually trade one, that's fine. Because you know that when you trade it, you'll know how it works. You've seen it enough times. You'll be able to trust it. Instead of going, well, you know, this guy said if this thing kind of moves down like 2% in the morning very quickly, bounces 1%, consolidates, and I've got to short it. You know, just watch that happen a few times before you actually do it, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, the power of catalysts. Eh? MTN, thanks for coming. Here's our little trade. A little range, a nice little consolidation. Looked like it broke out. There was some bad news. Broke below. You think, okay, maybe it's, you know, tested, it's made new lows. Not the end of the world. Bang, catalyst. And this thing almost pulls the whole range in a day. If you go even further back on the weekly chart, the target is something like 56 rand or something if it breaks these lows. It is scary. So, and everybody was long at that 103 level, eh? I mean, it's rock solid. It's not going anywhere until the catalyst comes along. So you must be aware of what's going on in the environment around you if you, if you want to be able to do this. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.